Hello and welcome to TIFF Rewind, presented by Bell. Today we're going back to the 2002 film, Real Women Have Curves. I'm Cameron Bailey, the artistic director and co-head here at TIFF. TIFF is located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. This territory is protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We're grateful to be working on this land and we're committed to learning and sharing more of the stories of indigenous people here. We encourage you to reflect on the land that you're on as well and its history. Big thanks to everybody who makes what we do possible. Here at TIFF, our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris and Visa, as well as our major supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario and the City of Toronto. I'd also like to thank our members and donors for their continued support. This year, TIFF is inviting audiences to take a walk down memory lane as part of TIFF Rewind, presented by Bell. It's a free series of digital talks with filmmakers and actors who revisit past film premieres at the festival. You can watch the talks with special guests on TIFF's social media channels or on TIFF's digital platforms during the festival. And with a Crave subscription, Canadian audiences can stream the films on the Best of TIFF collection on Crave. Today, we're revisiting Real Women Have Curves, which premiered in January 2002 at the Sundance Film Festival, where it won the Audience Award and a Special Jury Award for Acting for America Fer Ferreira and Lupe Antiveros. In September of that year, it made its international premiere here in Toronto. It's my great pleasure to introduce our special guests, the director of Real Women Have Curves, Patricia Cardoso, and the film star, America Ferreira. Welcome to you both. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, Patricia America, it's been 20 years since you made the film and 19 years since it launched at Sundance and, and then in Toronto for its international premiere. Since then, it's become a defining movie for the representation of Latinas, for Latinx families generally, for women. Um, but when you were making it, how much of that was the goal? Was that in your mind at the time? Well, you know, I think for me, I, I was telling a story that was very personal to me. And, uh, you know, it was a mother-daughter story, and I wanted to represent us the, as real and as authentically as possible, and also to represent Los Angeles, which is a city where I've lived for, like, uh, 25 years that I love to. And so, you no, know, I had no idea that the impact that it was going to have would be so, so long-lasting, which is amazing, because, like, every every year like i keep traveling the world and talking and i get i meet people that tell me how much that movie have changed their lives 20 years later yeah. i'm sure and what america. about you america yeah i mean very similarly i i was 17 years old when we made the movie it was only the second job i'd ever had as an actress and um i knew for me that it was a miracle. I mean, I was first generation Latina American, born and raised in Los Angeles, you know, had had experienced so many of the cultural themes and issues that are explored in the film. And so for me to be in the perfect place in the perfect time to get to be the actress who, who got to embody Anna and tell that story felt like a, a miracle and a once in a lifetime gift. And I had no idea outside of what it meant to me and what it meant to us, those of us making the movie, mm -hmm. um, what it would mean to, to an audience, to a, to a US audience, much less an international audience. And, you know, I think um, when, when we premiered at Sundance, got the reaction we got, that was, so unexpected and then when we went international with it when we went to toronto when we went uh to international film festivals beyond that it was it was career defining and life changing for me at such a young age to see that such a specific story um with representation of faces that are so rarely represented in film, in art film, um, even today, to see that story transcend borders and cultural borders and gender borders and, you know, age and body type and, and like Patricia said, 
for 20 years to have constantly heard mm -hmm. what this film has meant to people. Um, I don't know that any of us could have predicted that, uh, mm -hmm. but at this point, it's um, it, it it is it it has been for me uh, one of the things that has defined why I do what I do and and what I aim to do with with what with my career. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to the casting. Um, and Patricia, maybe I'll ask you first, because casting the role of Anna, she is the center of the film, it's her story. It, that's a pivotal decision to make. Uh, America, as you said, you were 17 years old, you were a newcomer to feature films. How did you go about casting? How did you know that America was the one to play Anna? Well, you know, it was a very long process to find her, and then it was a very long process to convince the powers to be to let me cast America. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you remember that I brought you back for like two seven callbacks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember very well. <laughs> and it's because, you know, like I could see that she was the person, but uh, some of the people that, that were not convinced and I just had to, you know, I knew that she had to be. So mm -hmm. yeah, like the seven callbacks for a whole process. And, you know, the process began for, you know, like I knew I wanted like, uh, 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 someone who was 17, who was not like 25 playing 17 and had to be someone that was comfortable in her own body and that, you know, it had curves. And um, and so it took like, you know, it, I think we were casting for six months and I had a casting director in New York, a casting director in Los Angeles, a casting director in Texas and a casting director in Mexico City. Wow. And I saw hundreds of people. We had also uh, open calls like, is that what you call them? Casting calls, open calls, yeah. uh, with high schoolers in uh, in Los Angeles, and we put this the, the, the sign said, you know, like open. I, I still even have the advertisement because actually there is a, the academy is opening a museum in September, mm -hmm. and they're going to have a section for real women have curves. Oh, that's great! Wow. Uh, and next to us is Citizen Kane. What? <laughs> that's amazing. And we're the first gallery. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I think America. I contacted you about it about it a few years ago. Mm. I, I, that's amazing. That's so incredible. Yeah. That's so, and it turns out I have I have kept everything mm. in my garage. So I donated all my materials to the academy, mm. and and I had like the, like the headshot of all the actors, the originals. I have your headshot from like that time, mm. and all of that is going to be shown in the museum. I can't wait to see it because I don't even think I have that headshot or I have seen it. Yes, um, sure. Yeah, and then one of the things I remember, like one of the posters that we made that we distribute in in East LA, it says, you know, well, open call Saturday this time, and it says, and no skinny girls, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, I got there, and then all these skinny girls would come, you know, for the audition, and I'm like. But you know, it says no skinny girls, and then they they would tell me that they were not skinny, and the truth is, like, they didn't feel skinny, you know, because that's that's how we feel about our bodies. So it took a long time, and you know, I saw so many people, and I couldn't find someone, and and then I also when I was interviewing casting directors, I met one casting director who actually told me about America. He had because he had cast you for the television uh, movie for Disney, so. Yeah. He told me about you, and then I just kept telling the hire, the casters that I hired, you know, we need to track down this girl because he said she was great, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know we need, and then we, we couldn't find you, and then finally I also my friend Miguel Sandoval have worked with you in that movie, and he also told me, and then finally we track you down, and you were in Chicago, I and I was, and then like you sent us a, a a tape that you did of yourself, which was great, which I think I had somewhere. I, I couldn't find it for the museum, but I, I still hope that I have it somewhere. Oh, I know that if you are to have it. And and then uh, I love you. And then you, when you came back to here, we have you come here. And, and you know, you were like America. You were one of the smartest people I've ever met in my whole life. And that was so clear at that point then you're so articulate and and the america's resume your resume was like you know you've been acting since you were like four years old and you have played like hamlet and romeo and juliet and like wow <laughs> i want to hear your your version of this as well what was it like for you to be found by patricia this way 
it's amazing to hear that process because I didn't I didn't know about the connection with the Gotta Kick It Up casting director and with Miguel Sandoval, who I love so much. And that's so wonderful. Yeah, I had just I was 17. I was in my junior year of high school. I had just finished my very first job ever, which was a Disney Channel movie called Gotta Kick It Up. And I remember with the money that I um, that I earned on Gotta Kick It Up, I did two things. I bought a used car so that I could get myself to auditions and stop like taking buses and begging, you know, family members for rides. And I paid for drama camp, which was like my whole life. All I ever wanted to do was like go away to drama camp. That was like my dream. And I, I'd gotten into this program at Northwestern University, the Cherubs program. And I like paid basically all the money in my savings account to go to this drama camp. And like a couple weeks into this drama camp, I had a manager and she called me and she's like, there's this HBO movie that's casting and they want to see you, you have to come back. And I was like, I am not leaving <laughs> drama camp to audition for anything. Like I have waited my whole life to come to drama camp and I'm not leaving. And she's like, I cannot tell HBO to wait for you to finish drama camp. Um, so she's like, if I send you a camcorder, will you put yourself on tape? I was like, sure. So she sent me a camcorder with a tape that you physically put in. And my one of my friends at drama camp, Frankie, um, she, we, I sat on the floor cross-legged and she put the camcorder on top of like three books. And she read like the mom part and the boyfriend part and the teacher part. And I would love to see that tape, Patricia. Um, you know, my, amazing but I, I still remember the walk i remember the walk from my dorm to the fedex and like holding that tape and just i don't know why i so clearly remember that walk of like well it's off you know and i remember sending it off and not hearing back for a long time and then weeks later drama camp was over i was back in la and i uh, what i remember most about every subsequent audition was like shit, I need more gas money to get back to the audition. Like, it was like, how am I going to get downtown? I was like, I have the car. I don't have gas money. And every audition was like, OK, I got to, you know, I got to get there. Um, but it was a lot of auditions. I remember auditioning mm -hmm. with Lupe. I remember auditioning with Ingrid Olyu. I remember coming into audition with all the all the boys who you were considering mm -hmm. for the boyfriend role. And yeah, it was a grueling process for sure. Mm -hmm. But the whole time I was like, this is mine. I feel like this is mine. You had it. You knew that. I feel like a part of me knew it. But thank you for advocating, Patricia, and oh. pushing for me. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. You know, I just, you know, I just knew, I, I, I just knew you, you were it. Just, uh, and I'm a very persistent person, so I'm like, <laughs> sounds like you both. Whatever are. it takes. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you. There's so many defining scenes and moments of dialogue in the film. I want to ask you what it was like to kind of create some of those on set. Um, you know, pretty dresses aren't just for skinny girls. Turn the lights on. I want you to see me. You know, the the this is cellulite scene as well. Some of those have really become iconic for for a lot of viewers out there. Um, you talked a little bit before about you know what you hear from women who've seen the movie over the years, but. What was it like to create some of those scenes? Is maybe especially the ones that were in the the, the dress factory. Yeah, and uh, well, you know, I think that we have to give all the credit to Josefina because a lot of those lines were in in her play. You know, okay. they, they they were not just in the screenplay; they were in her play. And there was even one line that we took that we we cut out in the editing because it, it was not needed, but I love, which is after like. Anna is with her boyfriend for the first night, and then she says, uh, "Oh, I don't know why they say this is losing your virginity when it is gaining your sexual self." Do you remember mm -hmm. that, America? And, and and so is it a line that we said? Is yeah, you say that line. Yeah, but we take we took it out because it it was not. Who did I say it to? Did I say it to, to Jimmy? To Jimmy, not to Jimmy. I don't remember saying that. Yeah. What's a beautiful line, and uh, you know, and so I think you know, yeah, Josefina really, you know, just when she created that play, you know, she, mm -hmm. she's just an incredibly talented writer. This is Josefina Lopez who wrote the play. Yeah, that was wrote the play, and then she co-wrote the screenplay. 
-hmm. And um, and I think you know also a lot of things change during the, the pre-production process because I don't know America if you remember that we met at my apartment a few times and then we read it's a system that I had where I meet with the actors because usually there is no budget for rehearsal so I meet with I met with each of the actors I met with you individually and we read all your scenes and I read you read your past and I read my my the other past do you remember that? I don't remember. Oh my God. I'm like, there are very, very distinct memories, like clear mm. memories that I have. Um, Tell us one of those. I'm curious. What What do you remember distinctly? Yeah. Well, I remember, um, I, I, I very distinctly remember the very first time I read the full script, which was after I sent my audition tape. And I remember loving it and feeling so just blindsided that there could be a story that was so representative of an experience that I'd had, especially because, you know, I had been, I'd wanted to be an actress for so long. And all I'd been told my whole life was that like, there wasn't anything for someone like me, you know, and then to get this screenplay. And I remember reading it and then giving it to my mom to read. And my, my, my mom asking me like, are you gonna, like, do you think you can take your clothes off? Like, do you think you can do this? And I remember just being like, yeah, yeah, I do. Like mm -hmm. not having any hesitation about it. And just like, it was, it was, there was a lot of naivete, but a lot of confidence at 17 that like, I got this. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm still in awe of that 17 year old girl who like just had very few hesitations. Um, you know, I remember that it was 2001 and that the very first day of our rehearsal, what our, we had a rehearsal downtown at the factory, Patricia, if you remember, and I was on my way down to rehearsal and it was September 11, 2001. And I remember getting the phone call, um, don't come downtown, you know, they're shutting things down. And then I remember things being delayed for a while. Um, production being delayed and then and then finally us getting back up on our feet but what i remember about rehearsal and filming of those scenes in particular the 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 dancing naked in the in the um, factory you know i just remember the spirit of the women and of lupe ontiveros in particular lupe was such a massive influence for me really for the rest of my career but as a 17 year old starring in my first film she was such a guiding force and, and, and she was just pure permission and pure creative, uh, you know, presence. And, and we would rehearse and we would play. And, and even in my auditions, I remember Lupe just always, you know, being Lupe, always improv always doing her own thing. And it's a little bit like, she knew exactly how to push my buttons. Like we fell right into like a mom, daughter thing right away and we like recognized a real stubbornness in each other and i just remember it always being so fun because from the beginning it was like she had me on my toes and i was so um determined to not let her get the best of me and lupe was just a dream i couldn't have asked for a more you know generous and and really supportive screen partner who was just there pouring permission on me all the time like do it go for it feel it like and and she wouldn't say it she would just be there with her presence and um and i and her and all the other ladies ingrid and all the women in the factory who you know they'd been they were all vets they've been acting their whole lives and and i this was my first really my first film and 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 just having their support and having their experience in the room and and their love for me, you know, was it was just it lifted me up. And and obviously Patricia and and Josefina there, um just oh, everybody had so much love to give and confidence in me. And it and it helped me, you know, bring what I, you know, bring the best that I could at that time. Oh my God. You know what the full circle of it all is, is that, you know, 20 years later, I'm about to direct my my first feature film. Oh, my gosh. Which Amazing. Is based, based on a novel called I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter, which is a beautiful, oh. beautiful novel. And the lead is like a 17 year old Mexican-American girl from Chicago. And wow. we're about to set off on this 
search for this girl and to hear you talk about okay. like, how you were casting and how you were looking for um, Anna. That's I, we're just about to go into that, so it's so mm -hmm. inspiring and also so full circle and I don't know meaningful to me. That's amazing. You know, there are so many um, stories I would love to hear from making the film. And, and I, I know that we're, we're out of time, unfortunately, but, you know, even with the challenges that I think are still out there for Latinx representation in the movies, I feel like Real Women Have Curves was such a groundbreaking film. It's been so inspiring for so many others. I just want to thank you both for making this movie um, mm -hmm. and that it still continues to, to inspire uh, people, especially I think uh, uh, Latinas, uh, but everyone, uh, I think. So thank you for making the film. Thank you for this conversation today. And um, I think it's made a lot of people want to go back and watch the movie again. I just watched it this week and I was really inspired again to see it. And thank you for bringing it uh, almost uh, 20 years ago to the Toronto Film Festival as well. Thank you both. Thank well, thank you for having us. Of course. And if you're in Canada, you can go over to Crave and you can watch Real Women Have Curves uh, again or for the first time. Uh, so thank you again, uh, America Ferrara and Patricia Cardozo.